Hello, family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we have a very special lady to share with you today. We are standing on holy ground as we look at all the tombstones of these faithful brides of Christ that preceded and then followed Blessed Dina Belanger. We see their names that they were baptized and then their uh, religious names. And so many of these names come and are seen also in Acadiana, Louisiana. All the time that we were here in this beautiful convent, we felt so at home. It's something that we know and understand. This is holy ground. Dina Belanger was born in Sillery, Quebec, Canada on April 30th, 1897. Throughout her life, Blessed Dina was aided by Our Lady, the saints, and the angels who were assigned to her to guide her on her pilgrimage of life. She wrote, it seems to me that in the earliest moments of my life, God wrapped the protective cloak of the Blessed Virgin around me. My eyes first saw light on the eve of the month of Mary, a Friday, and that very evening the grace of holy baptism drove the devil out of my soul to let the Divine Spirit reign as its master. We've been very gifted by the Lord in being able to research and study the lives of so many holy people. And we believe that saints beget saints. The, uh, this occurred in the life of Saint Therese, the little flower, whom this saint parallels so closely. We also believe in the case of uh, Dina Belanger's mother and father, it was the same. They were, everybody who knew them, especially the mother, said that they were living saints. Dina recalled her mother signing her with the sign of the cross while she was still in the cradle. She learned how to kneel at 12 months old and pray the Hail Mary before she was two. She prayed the Angelus with her family. From early childhood on her mother's knee, she heard stories of the Bible, the angels, and the saints. You know, when I was a young girl at about 10 and 12 years, I knew Mr. and Mrs. Belanger because they came here in Sillery every summer for two months and I was the pupil of Jesus and Mary, so I knew they were the parents of her saints. From the time she was a little girl, Dina had dreams of Jesus as a child and of being in paradise with him. Her greatest goal besides being in paradise was to receive our Lord Jesus in Holy Communion. When she was 10 years old, she received our Lord Jesus in the Eucharist for the first time. When she went up to the altar to receive, the devil tried to distract her with thoughts of various things, in particular, a silver watch which was given to her for her first Holy Communion. She fought these thoughts. She wanted to go up to the altar with a pure heart and a pure mind. She recalled, Great was my happiness. Jesus was mine and I was his. This first intimate union left in my soul, together with other graces, a hunger for the sacrament of love, a hunger which increased with each ensuing visit. Dina began to have interlocutions. On the Feast of the Annunciation, on the year after she made her first Holy Communion, the Lord spoke to her. During my thanksgiving after communion, our Lord communicated with my soul in a heretofore unknown manner. It was the first time I understood his voice so well, inwardly, of course, a sweet, melodious voice that filled my soul with bliss. The call to religious life tugged relentlessly at her heart. She began by asking her parents permission to go to a boarding school. This was to be a giant step in embracing her heavenly family and shedding her family on earth. Her time in boarding school began painfully. For the first two weeks, she cried every evening. Then for the next few weeks, she only cried every two or three nights. Finally, she stopped crying altogether. We believe that this is the most powerful statement of who this young woman was becoming and how her entire life would be governed. She broke her will to be open to his divine will. At 16, Dina left the boarding school. She went back to live with her parents, but the burning desire to enter religious life never left her. After seven months, not able to hold it in any longer, 
She asked permission to enter a religious community. Well, you can imagine their devastation. They said they would abide by the parish priest's decision, though. He recommended she wait until she were at least 23 or 24. Dina was obedient, but she couldn't just sit around for seven years. She had been extremely gifted as a pianist during her teenage years. She threw herself into a piano, spending hours each day practicing. She became so proficient, she played the piano in concert and was given rave reviews. She accepted them. A parish priest recommended she go to, con to the Conservatory of Music in Manhattan, New York. She stayed in a residence run by the religious of Jesus and Mary. The enemy used this time to attack her with an interior struggle which was to last for six years, her dark night of the soul. It began about four months after Dina had arrived in New York. It was a ferocious battle between Jesus, her great lover, and Lucifer, with her as the victim and the prize. She could not believe what was happening to her. She threw herself into her studies and prayer life. She became friends with two Canadian girls who had come with her from Quebec. The first girl, Bernadette Le Tourneau, was virtually thrust upon her. At first, this was very difficult for Dina, as she was used to privacy and the ability to study and pray as she desired. However, she never led on to Bernadette or anyone else. Their friendship would go far beyond the two years they spent together in New York. In June 1918, Dina's time in New York came to an end. She returned home to her parents in Sillery with three years to go before she could enter religious life. This was to be a time of learning, a time of close relationship with the Lord, a time of mysticism and interlocution. At times, she heard the voice of Jesus speaking to her, accompanied by a very bright light with images unfamiliar to her. She said, when entering upon this period of my life, I see myself submerged in an ocean of graces. She was being taught by the Master. But while she was being filled with unexplainable joy and wisdom, she was being attacked bitterly by her old enemy, Satan. The bright light was always followed by the darkness of the deepest night. She found herself in a continuous state of spiritual dryness. She countered these attacks with rigorous and relentless prayer, spiritual reading, and attendance at Mass. The Mass was where she encountered the greatest onslaughts, the enemy constantly trying to block her spiritual ascent to Jesus by distraction and vile thoughts. The times when Jesus came to her were worth any anguish she had to endure. He would only come to her in moments of calm and tranquility. If her soul was not at peace, he would first quiet it, calling forth feelings of humility and sorrow for her faults. She wrote, Jesus gave me for guide and luminary the host and the star. The host was himself, the star, none other than his incomparable mother. He showed me a path bordered with thorns wherein he wished me to tread after he had first walked on it. At the outset, the trials were not numerous, but as I advanced, they increased in number. In order to be faithful, I was not to allow myself to be dismayed by any suffering. The path was narrow and grew narrower as, I, as it became more infested with thorns. I had to push them aside as I advanced and I saw ever before me the host and the star representing Jesus and Mary in the path I was obliged to follow. At the end of the route which sloped upward, I could see, as on the summit of a mountain, a blessed door, that of my eternal home. There the Savior and his beloved mother would open for me in a few years, that tightly closed door, and what waves of joy would then inundate my whole being. I seemed already to see the door ajar, to behold the reflection of the pure rays of dazzling light that radiated from it, and to hear the echoes of angelic melodies. Dina was able to distinguish these scenes with the eyes of her heart more clearly than if she had seen them with the eyes of her mind. By means of heavenly images, Jesus acquainted her more and more with the idea of suffering. 
During all of this, the Lord mentioned oftentimes that he was preparing her for a mission. The year was 1920. G Dina was 23 years old. She applied to the Congregation of Jesus and Mary and was accepted immediately. The Lord gave her a superior to whom she could confide, unburden herself of all her questions, especially about her interlocutions and the visions of Jesus. The Lord gave her another gift when she entered community. A dear friend from her years in New York, Bernadette Letourneau, entered the convent the same day as Dina. Dina was ready to be clothed on February the 15th, 1922. She took the name Marie Saint Cécile du Rome after Saint Cecilia, a virgin and martyr of the early church. From the very beginning of her novitiate, she embraced poverty, chastity, and obedience with a passion. She took part in all the duties and activities of the other nuns. All during this time, she was communicating with our Lord Jesus. After her death, her mistress of novices shared much of what Dina had been experiencing. She testified that at one time, while the community was enjoying a picnic, Dina, laughing and playing with the others, was receiving instruction from the Lord. No one could tell she was having an interlocution. The Lord told her, you will do good by your writings. And so she began to write poetry, verse, plays, and musical compositions. The Lord blessed all of Dina's endeavors. In 1923, the congregation was given the permission for the Blessed Sacrament to be reserved in their chapel. Mother Elizabeth, the mistress of novices, was given a strong word by the Lord to call it the Eucharistic Heart. On June 7th, the first Mass was celebrated in the new oratory. It was also at this time that Jesus told Dina that her mission would be focused in love of and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. He told her of the promises and desires of his Eucharistic heart. Our Lord asked me to console his outraged heart in the Blessed Eucharist. One first Friday of the month during my private adoration before the Blessed Sacrament exposed, I seemed to see a multitude of souls rushing to their eternal damnation. Some were on the brink of the abyss and on the point of falling. Jesus told me that I could save these souls by praying fervently for them and offering him little sacrifices through love. I did so immediately, and I saw these souls conquered by divine grace leaving the camp of Satan. One very interesting thing about Mother Sister Elizabeth was that she prayed that out of all the novices that she was to instruct, she would get one saint, one saint would come to her. And the Lord blessed her and gave her her gift, and that saint was Blessed Dina Belanger. On August 15, 1923, she made her profession. Jesus asked her to climb into his boat. By this he meant that she was to leave the convent at Sillery and go to the school of San Michel de Belchasse, which was operated by the Congregation of Jesus and Mary. She was to teach to the music to the children. She spent five weeks there. The students adored her. We are, uh, we are awesomely standing in the room of Dina Belanger, where she uh, slept. This was her cell. And it, the, the room was from here like this. And it ended at this side of the window. So she had this one window. And it wasn't a very large room. But she was only there for a week when she contracted scarlet fever from nursing a student who already had the disease. She became very ill and was sent back to Sillery, to the infirmary. This illness was the beginning of many illnesses which would lead to tuberculosis and eventually her death. Back at Sillery, she felt completely useless in the infirmary. However, the greatest sacrifice she had to make was to abstain from receiving the Eucharist for 10 days. She had to be isolated and quarantined from everyone because her condition was so contagious. It grieved her each morning to hear the little bells ring when the priest was coming to give communion to the patients in the infirmary and she could not receive. Dina had always reached for complete abandonment to God, a death to self. On November the 3rd, she began a 10-day retreat. Jesus told her that at the end of that retreat, she, he would allow her to undergo a transformation which would put her in a state of annihilation and death to self. Dina 
Wagner writes, He showed me an altar, rather elevated, above which rose brilliant flames of fire. This was the altar of his love. In his hand, I saw my heart, my very own heart, which he had taken from me during the postulate retreat. He made me look at it so as to provide me with the opportunity of giving myself to him again, only more completely and freely. Then he placed it on the altar. The fire surrounded it, and I saw it being consumed to its last fiber. There remained nothing of it, absolutely nothing. Then Jesus invited me to go up the altar myself. There were five steps to climb in honor of the five sacred wounds. In my soul, there was peace and happiness. I placed my foot on the first step, then the second, and kept on in a spirit of abandonment. I soon reached the center of the altar. The flames moved apart on each side of me and did not touch me. The good master, his eyes always upon me, made me open up my arms as on a cross. Immediately the flames rushed upon me with violent intensity, moving slowly as they consumed my entire being. As this divine fire consumed me, my being shuddered, moaned, and finally it appeared to be dead at the moment of its complete destruction. When there was no longer anything to burn, the fire subsided and went out. In this center there remained some ashes. Jesus drew near, breathed on them, and destroyed them totally. I no longer existed. From that time on, Dina's role was to live in complete trust, abandonment, and love, to let Jesus do as he wished with her. A superior had an interlocution, directing Dina to write her autobiography. From the beginning of March 1924 until June 30th, under obedience, Dina wrote her life story and continued to write up to her death. During the next two years, she felt herself being drawn as victim soul, closer and closer to the Trinity. Dina was just completely open to anything and everything the Lord would have of her. She learned that she must live her life going through the twin hearts, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This was given to her on June 20th, the month of the Sacred Heart. The Lord also gave her another gift, a weapon to fight off the attacks of the devil, the Eucharist the real presence of Jesus, there for all of us in the tabernacle. When I pass by the chapel, I feel an irresistible impulse to go in. Before the tabernacle, I feel an indefinable joy. When the blessed sacrament is exposed, I am enraptured and paralyzed by the Eucharistic heart. When I leave the chapel, I have to tear myself away from the divine prisoner. If souls but understood the treasure they possess in the divine Eucharist, it would be necessary to encircle the tabernacles with the strongest of ramparts, for in the delirium of a devouring and holy hunger, they would press forward themselves to feed on the bread of angels. The churches would overflow with adorers consumed with love for the divine prisoner, no less by night than by day. Dina had a practice of setting aside Thursday to honor the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. On September the 2nd at noon, while she was meditating on the heart of Jesus, he spoke to her soul. Do you desire to drink of the chalice of my passion? She answered, oh yes, how good thou art. He repeated, do you wish it? The force of the words were like a dart of love piercing her heart. My Jesus, thou knowest that not only do I desire it, but that it is the only object of my desire. At that moment, an excruciating interior suffering took possession of her, a suffering that could not be put into words. She wrote, During the night, between Thursday and Friday, I was overwhelmed by a deep sentiment of compassion for my Savior. The physical pain was nothing compared to what my soul endured. My suffering had its origin in the heart, and from there it spread out over my whole being, seeming to bruise every part. I was oppressed by a crushing sense of loneliness and yet drank deep drafts of joy. The following Friday, September the 10th, Jesus asked her again, Do you wish to drink of my chalice? She replied, Oh yes, indeed, my Jesus. From that time on, Dina was given the gift of sharing in the passion of Jesus every Thursday and Friday. She was ecstatic to be able to console our Lord Jesus as if they were in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
She felt so close to him, sharing in his cup of passion. It could never get better than this, and then the Lord gave her his most special gift. She wrote, On the 22nd of January, we had the closing ceremony of the 40 hours adoration. During my meditation before the Blessed Sacrament exposed, I suddenly felt myself enveloped in profound peace. I was already conscious of the presence of my Divine Master, but this was something more than the ordinary union of Thursdays and Fridays. Our Lord was granting me a great favor, the stigmata of his sacred wounds. From his divine heart, flames radiated on the feet, hands, and heart of my annihilated being. The Blessed Virgin applied these flames to my hands and feet, and Jesus imprinted on them the stigmata of love of his sacred wounds. He was granting one of my most cherished desires, but he astonished me by granting it at this moment when I was not expecting it, and in this manner which I could never have imagined. As with most genuine stigmatists, Dina begged our Lord Jesus not to let her stigmata show. She didn't want anyone to know that she had been given this special gift, and the Lord answered her prayer. A time was to come when the Lord told her he was taking her home. In the spring of 1926, she began to show signs of pulmonary tuberculosis. She suffered greatly until it became full-blown. It would lead to an early death for our little saint. She managed to hang on until she made her final vows on August the 15th, 1928. But after that, she was preparing for the road home. She had always desired heaven. She had, was promised heaven by her lover, our Lord Jesus. On April the 30th, 1929, her birthday, she was moved into the isolation ward for tuberculosis patients. It was the place from which few ever come back. She was on her way. She was more in heaven than on earth towards the end of her life. She was just shackled to her body, but her soul had already soared to the high places. But the devil was not about to let her go peacefully. He kept pulling her back to earth with doubts, trying to break her faith in her relationship with Jesus. Dina fought valiantly, but could only succeed through the saving efforts of her God, who was by her side to the very end. Dina was given the last sacraments of the church on September the 4th, 1929, at three in the afternoon. She took her last breath. At the time of Dina's last a minute, you might say, she had such an angelic smile. Sister, what you're saying is that she was smiling to the very end? Oh, yes, she had a very angelic smile. We had the same mistress of novices, many of us, and she would tell us about it. So you recognized, and the whole community recognized that you had a saint here. And when, when Dina lived, no, she was like the others, you know, and she did nothing special. But the day after her death, people said, what could we say about her? But we realized after a few uh, months, even a few months, they uh, start to pray her. And the favors were all... Uh, answered. Oh, yes. So uh, 10 years after her death, there is a miracle. The 4th of September in 1939, Jude Giesson, who lived in New Brunswick, was cured by Dina of water on the brain, it was the, the 4th of September, her anniversary, the anniversary of her death. 10 years later, right to the day, right to the that day. she died, yes. a miracle was proclaimed in her name. And it was the miracle that you, they used, and Mr. Giasson was at the beatification ceremony with his family. when virtues like obedience, commitment, chastity, modesty, and accountability are all but lost to our modern society, the Lord gives us blessed Dina Belanger, a precious child of Jesus who embraced all these qualities. What the Lord gave Dina was definitely for her, but not only for her. It was for the thousands and possibly millions who would read her testimony and feel the warm embrace of the great master. Saints beget saints. Blessed Dina Belanger was beatified on March the 20th, 1993, 
and the next day the foundress of the community, Sister Claudine, was canonized on March the 21st, 1993. In the song, Holy Ground, mm -hmm. there is a part of it that says, and there are angels <laughs> all around. <laughs> this is what we have. We have with us angels. Mother Angelica, we love you. And all these sisters love you. <laughs> and they're so excited that they will have their saint and her story on EWTN. Thank you, Mother. <laughs>